Hello and welcome. I'm Helen Atkinson, Senior Editor at Supply Chain Brain, and I'm excited to be moderating this webinar today, sponsored by SAP, the topic for which is helping steer your logistics operations to become a more resilient supply chain. In this era of heightening customer expectations, logistics is leaving behind its supporting role to become a critical value differentiator. With retail and e-commerce becoming a business model in practically every industry, timely and accurate delivery is essential when creating the product experience. Today, you're gonna to hear from two customers about how they are using SAP transportation management technology to manage their freight operations in these dynamic times. You're also going to learn about recent innovations in SAP transportation management, and we'll review the latest roadmap for SAP TM. After the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. Please submit questions at any time using the tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll not be using people's titles or company names, so go ahead and ask whatever you'd like. If you don't see your question answered during the webinar, please be assured the SAP team will reach out to you offline. Right, let's get started. We have three speakers today, SAP as service provider and two customers using their transportation management technology. And we're gonna have a conversation about exactly what they're doing and how they're benefiting. Our speakers are Bill King, Director of Digital Logistics Solutions Management at SAP, and two clients, Nancy Hill, AIT Business Analyst at Steelcase, and Kim Price, Sales and Distribution Project Manager at Charlotte Pipe and Foundry. All right, with those introductions, I'm going to hand it over to Bill at SAP. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, and good afternoon for anybody who might be ahead of the Eastern time zone. Um, today, I'd just like to get things started by talking about, you know, basically trying to give you a, a view of our view of the market of, you know, when we talk to customers and talk to analysts and, and do research, you know, some of the trends we're seeing. Uh, and some of these pre-existed, uh, you know, the recent pandemic, um, but some of them just got exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, first and foremost be transportation costs. I think you'd have to be living under a rock to not be aware of the, the, the increases in costs, whether it be fuel, labor, you know, materials, what have you. Um, and likewise, the increasing complexity um, uh, that you are facing within uh, the you know, transportation and logistics industry, um, even before the the, the recent uh, increased focus on sustainability, or you know, yeah, re recent increase in uh, focus, I should say, um, there's been complexity. Whether it was having to try and shift uh, to adapt to what was going on within COVID, or through natural disasters, a la, you know, Suez Canal, things like that, um, there's just been you know a lot of complexity, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, resilience needed, if you will, or need flexibility. Um, another thing is, is, you know, ties into sustainability is, you know, how do we better use our assets? Um, there was a study done years ago that basically talked about, you know, only 50% of the trucks uh, in, in the EU uh, actually have a full load. So right there, it's, it's you know, there's, it's bad for sustainability, it's bad for asset utilization, it's bad for cost, okay? Um, and then the increase, uh, you know, need for visibility. Um, I've been in the industry long enough to know that we've been talking about visibility for quite a long time. We're talking decades, but it's been over the past you know, five or so years where there's got to, there's been a lot more traction in that space uh, in terms of how do we how do we actually not just get it but deliver on it and how do we leverage it and use it. Uh, and then, you know, again, you know, just the, the explosion uh, in the number of devices that our people are using, whether, whether tracking, you know, containers, tracking rail cars, tracking the conditions in those, uh, uh, your containers, you know, for the temperature, humidity, things like that. Um, or, and then if you have your own fleet, also tracking, you know, various uh, KPIs on the actual engines uh, and the equipment themselves. Okay. So those are just some of the, the, the dynamics we're seeing. Um, you know, taking that and taking it a little bit higher level, what we've seen across logistics in total uh, at SAP, when I say talk, talk about logistics and what that means, that's, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, is it, there's like a new reality, okay? Um, I mentioned, you know, being flexible, being adaptable. There's a new need for resilience. You know, that's for that part of me being part of the session title today is how do I have 
you know, systems and processes in place that let me adapt to the unexpected. Um, it's always been like contingency plans and for transportation, we've always had to have it at least for weather. Um, but from a logistics perspective, it's, it's, you know, you know, for warehousing might be labor, you know, contingency, it just become that much more important with all the things that have been happening, you know, over the past two years, you know, pandemic, um, weather now, most recently what's going on in Eastern Europe, things like that. Um, and then the other thing is, is, uh, you know, how do we, how does logistics work with industry 4.0? Um, how does it, you know, dovetail and connect to the, the manufacturing so that we're working and supporting that part of the supply chain? And then from us, you, know, you know, this kind of ties into, the next one ties into visibility is how do I have, you know, transparency digitally of what is going on in the real world? Okay, how do I create that digital twin of, of the real world that, and then take advantage of it and leverage it? Not, you know, visibility is one thing, but then being able to use it and actually uh, make use of it. Okay. Um, and then I think Helen mentioned it. It was, you know, basically, um, and other folks have mentioned this, uh, is basically, you know, it's becoming much more common to have that end user uh, focus, um, not just in retail, not just in e-com, uh, because almost every industry now has some aspect of that. And even if they don't, there's an expectation because all of us are users or you know, folks that um, work in that kind of, or you know, in your personal lives, it's the Amazon effect, if you will, you know, I'll call it what it is. And then sustainability. There's just been this drastically increasing focus on sustainability. I've been in transportation for over 20 years. I always joke, we were green before green was cool um, because you know, for a from a transportation perspective, it just made sense to drive fewer miles, to save fuel, um, to be more efficient in my, my, my route you know creation and route execution things like that it's just like the rest of the world caught up and said hey that's a great idea we need to you know reduce carbon uh you know co2 uh greenhouse gases things like that um it's just other parts of the organization have now taken it you know like from packaging and things like that um and at sap for one thing we've actually you know established two years ago the climate 21 initiative um where obviously transportation is part of it but it's a part of a bigger focus or bigger approach um from a corporate world uh, perspective. So it's also sustainability, um, uh, equity, and, and governance. Okay. Um, and then, you know, having said what, you know, that's, you know, what the challenges are and what the, you know, trends we're seeing is some of the areas that we see folks looking for us to innovate and where we are innovating. And I won't go through all of this, but it's the logistics convergence. And it's, it's a, a a theme I will talk about, you know, throughout is how do I tie together the different parts of the supply chain is even you know, further. How do I tie together the different parts of the, just the logistics operations? Um, freight networks, you know, tying in and being able to connect to those networks uh, for carriers, for visibility, for um, a collaboration perspective, uh, supply chain visibility in, in itself, one area. Um, automation and you know, my warehouse brethren being able to automate and uh, the increased uh, use of a robotic. I already mentioned sustainability, secure data uh, exchange and document exchange. This is getting more into like the blockchain parts of the world where I have trade documents, how, what's going on there? How do I more efficiently do that so I don't have to be so reliant on, you know, overnighting stuff and paper-based uh, processes? Uh, an area that we, you know, started working on a couple of years ago as part of a, a Qualtrics, uh, part of the Qualtrics act, uh, acquisition was how do I uh, capture what the experience is within the logistics, logistics excuse me, logistics processes. Um, from a carrier's perspective, like, you know, what are they, you know, what get feedback from them? And then also from a shipper perspective, you know, what, what feedback, what experience are they having? So that I can use that information to improve and tweak my processes. Um, and then insights and intelligence, this is uh, an area that kind of touches on the networks and supply chain visibility space. It's how do I capture that visibility? How do I capture, you know, or, or better um, look at what's going on in the real world? You know, what's going on you know, via weather? What's going on in terms of, you know, uh, political situations or labor situations, you know? Um, and then based on that, what, you know, what does that mean to my supply chain? to my actual uh, shipments, uh, to my replenishment orders, things like that. And then also how do I, you know, okay, now that I know it, what, what are suggested or what are things I can do, you know, based on, you know, not just, you know, being notified and reacting, but proactively you know, being able to say, okay, what can I do ahead of time? Okay. Um, 
when I talk about logistics at SAP, um, we talk about this platform, if you will. So transportation, which is I'm the you know solution owner for, um, warehouse management uh, and yard logistics. Uh, you know, you know CFTM is great for managing the activities between facilities. Warehouse management is great for managing within my four walls the warehouse. Uh, yard logistics is okay. What happens between the gate where my truck you know shows up when my process usually kind of comes to an end or starts, if, depending on how you look at it, um, and before it gets onto the dock door. So yard logistics helps manage that process. And then advanced available to promise is basically, how do I take and you know rationalize, okay, I've got limited supply, what's the best way to uh, you know, take that limited supply and meet all of my customer uh, backlogs and back orders and things like that. And then logistics business network is a, a relatively new uh, initiative at SAP. It's a few years old, but it's a, a, a platform, uh, a, you know, public cloud uh, multi-tenant solution that lets you plug in or connect to already uh, onboarded carriers um, for collaboration purposes um, or, you know, on board or connect to already onboarded um, different networks. Um, the idea being is we have one network where we can connect, you know, all the different logistics players out there, whether it be established networks, established carriers. And, you know, the idea was, you know, it's, it gives you that flexibility to, so you don't have to do the onboarding yourself one at a time, but then also it helps manage, you know, you don't have to have one platform or one portal for uh, domestic and one portal for international or one portal uh, for ocean and another portal for uh, over the road. It's, it's, it lets you have um, one, network you can plug into for all modes, all regions of the world, okay? Now taking a little bit deeper dive, looking at uh, TM, and I'll try and be uh, brief because I know everybody really wants to talk here, Nancy and Kim, um, but when we talk about TM or transportation management uh, at SAP, what does that mean, okay? And, and they can give you a better idea you know, from, you know, from end user perspective, is it's a comprehensive end-to-end a solution for managing your transportation processes and operations um, for shippers or freight forwarders uh, for large and for small. Okay. Um, and it's for, it's one solution that can be used to manage both your domestic as well as your international all in one solution. Uh, if, whether it's inbound or outbound or intercompany moves. Um, and it can be used for folks that have very simple uh, processes um, or folks that have very complex. And when I talk about that, what I'm saying is, you know, I have some folks that have very simple, you know, single pickup, single delivery truckloads. Um, they can do that. Or um, it could be, you know, they have, you know, 10, 20 stops on a load. Or it could be multi-leg, multimodal, uh, transoceanic uh, shipments. Um, and that's more from a planning perspective. From an execution perspective, uh, the example I always give is, you know, uh, we have folks that actually are, you know, the guys that have the 15 to 20 uh, stops per load, you know, they want to get status updates so that it's complex from that perspective. We have other folks that it's single, still a single pickup, single delivery uh, load, um, but they're oversized loads and they're going from, uh, you know, the mid, you know, the central part of the, the, the country to a port and they've got to be able to uh, manage and interact with different uh, authorities um, for getting these oversized loads through diff different jurisdictions, different towns. So they have on average 25 to 50 milestones that are tracking. So there's a complexity from an execution perspective as well. Okay. Um, and then from a you know, TM perspective, I kind of try and give you a visual because I'm just the way I, I work is, you know, from a, a process perspective, you know, we work, like I said, with, you know, shippers and logistics service providers, um, whether they be forwarders or carriers, um, and we connect to them via the uh, logistics business network or LBN. But then from a process perspective, we support all the, you know, all five of those circles you'll see there, whether it be managing or my uh, capacity ahead of time. So I get that set up um, or, you know, for procurement of rate or uh, capacity information. How do I manage the order data into uh, TM? whether it's coming from SAP or non-SAP. Um, how do I manage the changes, which is something a lot of people forget to think about, um, and you know, which is very often very critical. And then how do I do the planning? Okay, and this is the meat and potatoes of, you know, you know the, the, the 
load consolidation, the mode selection, the carrier selection, the equipment selection, things like that. And then execution. This is, you know, you have track and trace, which ties into execution, which a lot of people think that's when they think execution, they think track and trace or visibility or simply where's my stuff. But it's also how do I connect to other processes? How do I connect to global trade for uh, harmonized tariff classification or order screening or restricted party screening? Or how do I uh, uh, coordinate with hazardous materials or dangerous goods uh, so that I know I have the right information. Uh, so I'm planning, uh, you know, I make sure I don't put, you know, uh, monkeys and bananas in the same truck. Okay. Um, or how do I, um, you know, work with the warehouse? Okay. You see down below that, you know, right there, warehouse management, you know, whether it's inbound or outbound, how do I communicate and coordinate with that, those processes? So again, I'm not just throwing something over the wall to them. Okay, and then finally, you know, you got to pay the, the the carriers for moving the stuff. How do I manage that? How do I allocate the cost? How do I do the final settlement? How do I manage disputes? Things like that. So that that's a very quick and dirty overview um, of you know TM within the logistics space within TM. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nancy now. Hey, good morning. All right. Um, welcome to everybody. Thank you, Bill. Um, appreciate that. So a little bit about myself and Steelcase, um, give you guys an overview. So Steelcase, we are a global office furniture industry leader. Um, we offer um, architecture, furniture, and technology solutions, really supporting all the ways people work, which has changed over the last couple of years. Um, we are primarily make to order. Um, so we don't make really your office runner until, until it's ordered because we don't know what you're gonna want. Um, and our product is highly configurable. Um, and we even have options for specially engineered products um, when needed when our standard offering doesn't quite meet um, the requirement. Um, we do operate around the globe and we support customers in all industries, including education um, and work from home. Um, we have uh, plants, we have, I'm going to be talking primarily today about North American operations, so um, really uh, U.S. and Canada. Um, we have plants in Reynosa, Mexico. We have a plant in Tijuana, Mexico, um, northern Alabama, and then here um, I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, we also have many suppliers for both um, raw parts and finished goods all around the area. Um, they're primarily sourced regionally near our manufacturing facilities, but there are some outliers, all, like I said, all across um, North America. Um, from those uh, plants, we consolidate product into one of seven distribution centers before we ship to a customer. Um, and those distribution centers are, um, we have in Southern California, uh, the Seattle area, the Dallas area, Atlanta, Eastern Pennsylvania that um, uh, services our East Coast, um, we also have a DC in Denver and also here in Grand Rapids as well. Um, so I am a, um, if you add it all together, I'm about a, I'm about 25, 26 year employee of Steelcase. I was here for about 23 years. Um, I started as a transportation planner. I became a technical liaison and I was an SME subject matter expert for many, many projects um, throughout the years, including our SAP TM implementation. Um, I did leave Steelcase for a couple of years. I actually joined a TM consulting firm. Um, realized as much as I liked working with TM, I didn't love the consulting life. And so I came back to Steelcase a couple of years ago. Um, however, I, I returned not to the business. I returned to the IT organization as a, as a business analyst, still supporting the transportation organization from a TM and our um, warehouse operations. So. Um, our TM story, I will talk a little bit about that. So um, way back in the late 2000s, I don't remember the specific years, but we implemented our first non-SAP TM uh, tool and process with an external 3PL. Um, that project really helped to consolidate and provide visibility to all of our transportation moves, as well as gain better control over our freight payment processes. Um, that experience, however, we learned a lot from it. Um, but over time, we realized that we could gain even more control, um, flexibility, access to our data, uh, and insights, real-time visibility, et cetera, really by insourcing that tool and processes. And so 
In late 2014, we started our SAP TM implementation. Um, our implementation timeline lasted about 14, I want to say between uh, 14 to 18 months. Um, we started uh, our rollout in early spring of 2016, and um, we rolled out through the summer of 2016. We did have a hard cutoff with our external 3PL, so that kind of expedited and enforced our, our uh, rollout being finished by the summer of uh, 2016. Um, we do integrate with SAP TM. We have an SAP ERP system up front. Um, and so we integrate with TM uh, with our SAP sales orders, SAP deliveries, purchase orders, um, basically uh, all, those, all those order type uh, order types. We also use SAP TM for, we have some moves that were manual that did not have a ERP origin. And so for those moves, we are using um, manual, what are called forwarding orders in TM. Um, we are managing our inbound, um, like I said, with that, with that purchase order. We are managing intercompany with the manual forwarding order. Uh, we're doing outbound with our deliveries. We actually integrate sales orders, which we actually plan on deliveries. So we're doing our outbound to customers. Um, and we're doing uh, many, many uh, um, processes within TM. So we're doing um, using the TM optimizer for vehicle scheduling and routing. So basically that's your, that's your load planning and, and you know, building the plan. Um, we're using carrier selection and tendering. Uh, we're using the carrier uh, collaboration portal, which um, Bill will tell you is, is eventually going to be replaced by the logistics business network, which I know he already talked about. Um, but our version is using the, the carrier uh, collaboration portal, excuse me. Um, we use that for carriers not on EDI. We do have a few carriers on EDI. And we're also doing freight settlement uh, in TM. And so um, that's really, I wanted to just give you an overview of, of what we're doing. And I will hand it back to Bill. Thank you very much, Nancy. I always learn something new when I talk to you guys and yeah, listen to you. So I appreciate it. Um, and with that, and now I'm going to hand it over to Kim Price uh, to you know, give an overview and, and do the same thing. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. Um, so we'll get started quickly. A little bit about Charlotte Pipe. So um, Charlotte Pipe and Foundry, we're located in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we have six manufacturing facilities across the country, and then we utilize distribution networks um, with distribution warehouses that we enter, um, we enter company shipments with stock transfers across the network. Um, just a few modes of transportation on this slide, which the next slide will actually show you the breakdown um, that we'll go to in just a second. Um, to utilize, to see that. So you can see the, the breakdown in the modes of transportation. So we're primarily flatbeds. We ship um, cast iron pipe and fittings, and we ship plastic pipe via flatbeds, and then we ship plastic fittings primarily via vans or LTL shipments. So all of those products service the um, plumbing industry as well as retail. Um, if you've been into any local hardware store and had a plumbing need, you've probably seen our product. Um, we do ship a very small percentage rail um, to the West Coast. We find that very cost efficient um, to send our stock transfers via rail. We have a, a uniqueness in our business because we are a cast iron and plastic manufacturer. We have something unique to Charlotte Pipe that we call a top load, um, which is on the pie chart at about 3%. But that is where we will, um, we will take um, cast iron product and we will shuttle it to another um, plastics facility. And then um, we use, um, we will combine those products together and then we will ship to the, to the customers from our plastics facility and we're utilizing TM for all of this functionality um, from planning to um, freight settlement. So we'll continue on. So this is a little bit about our, our flow. We, um, we do run um, ECC. We, um, we only integrate with ECC. We, know we, have, we do not have any external 
documents like the forwarding order that Nancy mentioned. So we're using sales orders coming out of ECC. We're doing standard orders, rush orders, um, and STOs. We also created a special order type for exports. Um, essentially, all of our orders flow to TM. We primarily do planning based on deliveries at this point with DTRs in, in TM. Um, the OTRs exist there. We have started um, looking at optimization in the last few years just to gain some efficiencies, as Bill mentioned, with the current climate and things changing with freight, just to look, um, just to be as efficient as we can. So we are looking at that and we're piloting uh, with some plants right now. So we, um, we build and we do our planning on NTM um, and then we do interface. We built some custom integration when we implemented TM with our shipping system. Um, after, the, after our freight orders are departed from the shipping system, they come back and we do freight settlement, um, cost allocation in TM and freight settlement, which integrates back to ECC. Um, so pretty standard flow. Um, we do pay our carriers automatically within 10 days after the AP hits SAP. So um, it, it's a very nice, consistent flow for, for, for our work process. So just a little bit about our journey. We started in 2015, um, actually earlier than that. We started probably 2013 researching, we had an in-house written system and we knew the technology that we had used was aging. We knew we needed a, a more holistic approach with more functionality. So we started doing some research. Um, obviously being an SAP shop, we looked at SAP first. We did look at some other third parties. Um, we came back and um, circled around after much, much research and about a year's worth of research, we came back and we did a, um, we did about a six week implementation um, or pilot process with a, a, a consulting firm, which confirmed that TM could do um, the majority of our, um, majority of our uh, operations. So we, started the implementation, which took about a year. Um, from there, we, um, in 2016, we, we looked at package building some. It did not work for us at that time. We're gonna relook at it again this year. Um, we also did an upgrade to 9.3. Um, we, we have automated our parcel processing. So we do small packages, which is, primarily 150 pounds or less with just um, plastic fittings, some cast iron fittings. Um, so we automated that in 2020. Um, we did some refresher training um, that was with IS and, um, and user training at that point as well. And then you can see last year and this year, we're looking at more of that automation piece with um, utilizing the optimizer more. And again, that is really just to gain more efficiencies throughout our process. And throughout the last couple of years, we've also done some things. We've tried to reduce the number of stops we have on, on our trucks with the flatbeds. Again, trying to become more efficient as possible with, the, with our processes. So with that, I think I'll turn it back over to, to Bill. Very much, Kim. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, we can talk about the package building because there's been a lot of changes since 2016. It's a little scary. It's oh, been that long. <laughs> I did. I did forget to mention we actually are uh, upgrading to nine six this year. It's a project we're we're almost um, we've started, but we have not. Um, we're only in the initial phases right now, so we can take advantage of some of that package building functionality in nine six. Well, that's a, that was a big focus of the nine six release, so. That's great. Okay. Thank you to everyone. Um, thank you so much, Bill, Nancy, and Kim. That was a very powerful discussion. It's always great to see uh, the, the testimony of people who are actually using this stuff every day. Um, and I think we learned a lot there. Now we're going to get to some questions from the audience. Uh, once again, please submit your questions at the tab at the bottom of your screen. 
and we'll not be using people's titles or company names, so you should feel free to ask whatever you want. And if you don't see your question during the webinar, please be assured the SAP team will reach out to you offline. So, um, it, interesting, most, most of these questions are not surprisingly for Nancy and Kim, but uh, we'll, we'll let Bill weigh in <laughs> from time to time. Um, but actually, and so I think this first question is really for all three of you um, from your different perspectives. What trends are you seeing in transportation and how have they changed since the pandemic started? I think I'm going to let Bill start with that, with those sort of high level view, maybe. Well, I mean, I, I think I kind of let off with some of those trends. Um, you know, there's been a, a, a drastic increase in um, a need for visibility. Uh, information, especially because uh, of COVID, people really needed to know where their stuff was, either as an end consumer, or I wanted to know where my, where my uh, grocery, what groceries were that I was ordering online now unexpectedly, or things like that. Um, and also, you know, sustainability, there's just been that incredible uh, increase uh, awareness and focus on, yeah, you know, realizing I need stuff, but I also realize that having a negative impact on the environment. Um, those are the, the two the biggest ones. I mean, from a technology perspective, there's also things, like I said, from a logistics perspective, you know, uh, what are you doing around uh, greenhouse gas tracking? What are you doing around robotics, uh, automation, whether it be automation of a process or you know, in the transportation world, what's going on with automated driving? You know, there's a lot of stuff like that. So I could go on forever, but I think most folks want to hear it from Kim or, or Nancy. So. <laughs> um, Kim, would, would you like to... Uh weigh in on that what changes have you seen in transportation and what trends well, uh, primarily for us we um we've had an increase in business so um quite a, a large spike since the pandemic um construction was viewed as critical and so we we did not slow down um what we have seen is a, a change in the the industry our wholesale industry um they did have some closures within the businesses, but retail, um, we have had a massive increase there across the, the business. So for us, we've tried to keep communication constantly uh, uh, coming out as the pandemic um, evolved across the last, uh, or through the last two years. So we tried to communicate with our customers, let them know what the situation was. Obviously we had, um, cases internally, we had issues with production, so those type of things. Um, but we've tried to look at um, shipping as efficiently as we can, optimizing loads, reducing the number of stops. Um, we've worked with our, our customers that do um, collect shipments or customer pickups. We've worked with them. They have seen an is had issues with carriers, getting carriers come in. Of course, we just have stage their material to be ready for them to pick up. So just trying to communicate is the, is, has been our number one, uh, oh. one number one avenue we've taken up because we, could, we had issues with meeting demand. And um, so it, it's been a uh, stressful several years for us. I bet. Um, Nancy, I'm going to guess that your experience has been with office furniture has been a little <laughs> bit different over the last two years. It, it has there's been a lot of things that have happened so actually Kim reminded me of things that have happened that I had kind of forgotten about mm -hmm. um, but as the pandemic started and you had um, you know the different parts of the U.S. were shutting so certain states would shut down but other states wouldn't and there was all this thing all these things were happening everything was in flux right when, when this thing started happening so we would have um, some areas where we couldn't deliver except for emergency um, what was considered essential and we are office furniture, but we also serve as hospitals and medical facilities and schools and things like that. So those types of things were considered essential. And so we had to, we spent a lot of time um, figuring out which orders were essential, which orders weren't, which orders we could ship, which orders we couldn't ship. And so there was a lot of that going on. It took a while to, for that to kind of uh, normalize across the country. Um, and then we had some plants that, uh, like I said, if that state was shut down early in the pandemic, that plant might have shut down except for those essential orders. So we, we had a limited number of people coming into manufacturing to work. We could only ship limited number of things. Um, as the pandemic progressed, 
obviously there was a huge shift. Um, in the past, we had a, a small percentage of work from home business, but it obviously wasn't our core. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> and we had a huge shift in um, that work from home business. And um, so we had a huge, a lot of uh, energy and effort focused on really flipping the business um, to that front end. We still do, still the, um, the big cor uh, corporations and hospitals and that type of stuff is still our core business, but we had a huge shift, right? And so we had a lot of energy and resources devoted to um, flipping that on the front end and, um, you know, driving more sales at the front end for work from home. Um, which unfortunately, that then that, I won't say unfortunately, but then that trickles downstream. But the what I was going to say was unfortunately the resources were at the front end, not necessarily at the back end, <laughs> and so we we were left kind of um, figuring out how to manage that significant increase in our work from home business. Um, like I said, we we just didn't have that type of volume in the past, so that was a that was a significant trend change for us. Um, I think. Uh, one of the things uh, Bill alluded to is I think uh, you'd have to be under a rock if you didn't understand, you know, from a, you know, more in the full truckload industry, obviously prices are up, driver shortages, um, uh, capacity. Um, we had, uh, like everybody did, you know, drivers had to be quarantined, you know, if, if a driver got sick, he was quarantined. Um, we have unload personnel at our, at our delivery sites and at the warehouses we were delivering, so that in, in, impacted our capacity at these sites and things like that. So um, I can go on, but that's... that's <laughs> My goodness, I, you know, uh, because uh, uh, the next question was going to be about pain points, but I think we've covered quite a few of those. Yeah. Um, so Drivers. <laughs> uh, uh, so drivers. many things uh, all coming in at once we, we, and, and, ra and changing and unpredictable. So I, I suppose that, that brings me to the next question again uh, for Nancy and Kim. What are some of the benefits you've achieved from using transportation management and how did they help specifically with these sort of fast moving targets and, and changing situations? Kim, so maybe I'll go first, if that's okay. Nancy, you go um, first. Yes, yeah, sorry. So I think one of the big things we saw, um, like I said, one of the reasons we actually brought it in-house from our 3PL was really about control and flexibility. Um, and obviously visibility was secondary to that, but it was important. But with the shifting, um, everything shifting in the last couple of years, um, and I'm gonna make a point here, one of the key things when we did our TM implementation is we were very conscientious about uh, not um, I'll say about keeping the system standard, using standard tools, standing, standard configuration, um, things like uh, conditions and um, planning profiles and things like this, and not doing much customization in terms of coding, right? So, and I, and I will say because I think one of the things is because we kept it standard, one of our big benefits is we, we have been able to make shifts in how we manage that backend transportation without a um, huge uh, IT resource constraints, right? So we've made changes to things like incompatibilities to drive certain, uh, certain behavior. We've made um, changes to uh, conditions to drive, to drive orders down a certain path. Um, we've used uh, different selection profiles that uh, the, the users use um, to, to look up various cockpits, really to drive those orders down those different paths. And so, because we've kept things standard, we've been able to have more of that flexibility that we needed throughout this uh, the last couple of years. Wow, that's that fantastic. A, I think that was a benefit that we had. Great, flexibility. Well, that's mm -hmm. obviously crucial, especially during these times. Kim, what about you? What, what, what were some of the benefits? So I, I think one of, um, one of the primary benefits we've seen is just the integration with ECC. So we had, um, Two, th two other systems in the past, actually three, that we had an in-house written planning system and we had an in-house written freight allocation system. And we had multiple points of failure within the integration with the multiple systems. So integrating with ECC as tightly as TM does is, is huge. Um, you're, all, you know, we run the SIF um, multiple times a day with um, customer um, 
creations for customer creations. Other than that, we run it at night for materials um, in, a in, a, in a job that's scheduled. But order creation, order changes, vendor changes, customer master changes, material master changes, everything works seamlessly, um, which is huge. Because if you <laughs> if you ever dealt with integration issues with, um, they're very uh, time consuming, and uh, it's just it's a point of failure that you take out of the. Um, out of the equation. So the integration is huge. And, and I can't say enough good things about that with SAP, but, you know, the freight settlement, the cost allocation was a, a huge benefit for us. We would written that in an in-house written system, but it was a lot of custom code um, that works extremely well for us. We did, we did create, we use standard for on the planning, um, selection profiles, again, all the things Nancy mentioned, we standard. We did do custom integration with a shipping system. Mm -hmm. um, we're running standard WM, but and not EWM. So we did integration with a, a third party with an in-house written syst shipping system, um, which has worked well. I mean, it, it's... Um, we had some very good consultants that helped us, so um, that went well. But um, we automatically pay our carriers within 10 days where, where um, the timeliness of the freight settlement documents and the, the we have very few issues with it. Um, planning is primarily manual for us. And when I say manual, we run the optimizer, we do carrier selection, um, and we also use um, we use Rand McNally for a mile, mile maker uh, to run our mileage through. So we're using a third party there, but that integration has worked well. We also use SMC3 for LTL rating, which works wonderful. So, um, I mean, the benefits have been huge for us. It's taken a lot of manual monitoring away from things that we did in the past with our previous systems. Right, that's great. I'm, I'm sure nobody listening has any idea about integration problems. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Um, but I think what I found interesting about what you said, Kim, was that you, you've, I think some people believe when they're going to implement these sort of systems that they have to give over complete control to this totally automated uh, set of systems. And it, it's interesting that you're, you're, you're using some different systems and you're tweak, tweaking them as you want manually. And you're not just sort of get, ceding all control over to a, to a, a software program. That's correct. That's correct. That's so, very good to hear. You know, I think you have to work with the, the business, the associates. You can't can't outpace what the associates can handle. So um, we looked at a more automated process in the beginning, but um, the business wasn't ready for that. And uh, it, it's worked well for us. Oh, that's terrific. That's that's wonderful. Um, so we've got another question here. This is an interesting. Were there any unexpected benefits? Was there something that you didn't anticipate? Again, Nancy, maybe you could start. Um, yeah, first I'll say I would second everything Kim said as well. And oh, great. <laughs> Super. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we had a lot of similarities there um, with that. With that. So. Um, unexpected benefits. So um, I think one of the things that did for us, and I, and I actually had a conversation with one of our transportation managers um, before this call too, just kind of talking to him about uh, uh, where, where they are um, uh, just, you know, concurring on certain topics before the call, right? But one of the areas that they, um, that he brought up was really this it really highlighted the importance for us of accurate data and well-defined business rules in the beginning of the process. Um, we really struggled in the past historically with, and we still, I'll be honest, we still do, with um, data that's not well-maintained, um, data that's uh, not, um, not filled in, it's, it's maybe, maybe it's invalid, uh, maybe it's not in the right spot. Um, maybe maybe we just didn't have data. And I'll say we've gotten better. We're still not where we need to be, but really this TM process or this TM project um, really highlighted the importance of that data. It's a it's a 
data-based, rules-based system, right? Mm -hmm. If you want good results out, you have to have good data in. Um, otherwise, you're going to be continually struggling with the output of your of your um, what the optimizer puts out, the out output of the system processes, and you're going to be um, continually manually um, reevaluating those results. Um, so you really need to push. And what what that did from our perspective, and I'm, I'm getting to the why this is a benefit, because it pushed that data up, uh, the need to to get that data correct up in this order entry process, and so. Yes, we. I, I will say yes. We still deal with it a little bit, but the more we can push it up front, the better we off in our, our in our processes and our outputs. Um, and if we can ensure better process compliance up front in terms of the sales order entry process and the data that they're using, um, it just it really highlighted the importance to get that right up front. And for us, that was a benefit to push that work forward. Right, that's very um, significant, yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on was, um, I know I mentioned it earlier, but I will say it again, I think partly because we tried so hard to keep our TM system standard, um, from an IT perspective, I can vouch for the fact that we get fewer support calls on TM related issues than mm -hmm. we do for our other SAP um, areas that are highly customized. <laughs> Right. So, um, and I think Kim spoke to that too with some of their customized custom programs where because the plug and play works better because you have standard um, standard integration tools. And yes, we have some third party um, call outs too to BC Miler and to SMC free and stuff, but they're standard call outs, right? Mm. Um, but because we tried to do a better job of keeping things standard, um, this was an unexpected benefit from my perspective that we have fewer support issues. Oh, that's great. That's terrific. What about you, Kim? Unexpected benefits? Um, well, I think we um, we had done so much research that we had such high hopes from our uh, <laughs> from our existing in-house written systems that um, you know we were just excited to have the, a new system and and be approaching something that could scale and uh, we would have less changes with. So. I, I can't really think of anything that was unexpected. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so uh, I've got a couple of uh, specific questions here, um, particularly about car how has cat COVID had an impact on your carrier availability? And I know you did talk a little bit about how you were dealing with all, all the COVID challenges, but specifically, um, you know, carrier availability and freight capacity was was that a particular issue for either or both of you? Probably, I'm guessing it was. Um, Nancy, yeah. Maybe. Um, so yeah, obviously it did. Um, we have, like I, I mentioned at the very beginning, we are made to order, and so any disruption in our supply chain really impacted our our ability to ship on time because we don't we don't have stock, right? We don't keep stock. <laughs> Um, so as our suppliers were impacted due to COVID, um, and again, part of that were those rolling closures around their various states, um, <laughs> and the, the definition of those, what we call essential orders, um, really impacted what suppliers could supply and what they could not supply and when they could get it to us. Um, obviously, um, there were driver issues, um, if a driver got sick, you know, he was quarantined, uh, obviously significantly impacted carrier's ability to meet um, commitments as well. Um, on the outbound side, uh, so on the inbound side, it was a supplier issue um, and getting uh, parts on in, in on time to, to meet the outgoing um, schedules. But on the outbound side, what, they were, what our team was trying to do was knowing that we would likely have product that wouldn't be able to ship on time, but we wanted to fill trucks. Um, they basically had to adjust their processes to over plan the, the trucks so that when the truck finally did ship, it was actually mostly full <laughs> and really trying to manage that, um, that back order process when product wasn't available to ship on time. Um, and still keep trucks full, um, you know, because we don't, with the driver shortages and the extra costs, 
you know, obviously you want to, you still want to ship full trucks, <laughs> minimize your cost and, um, yeah. and really use the capacity you do have. So um, that, those were some of the ways that, that some of the issues we had. Right. And, you know, how That's great. It. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Kim, mm -hmm. um, what, what clever uh workarounds did you come up with i wish we had clever but um typically the same issues we we um we plan the shipments we would still um have our daily shipping capacities at our plants at at max um, given the, our inventory situation but we would just basically work with our carriers we have um uh, standard carriers that we've used for years with um, mm -hmm. um, agreements in place with them. So um, they would let us know, hey, I don't have a driver to take that load. And then we would contact the customers to try to keep the customers up to date on, on you know, when we had shortages. But really, I think the, the good part is that everyone was in the same situation. Mm -hmm. So um, customers were very understanding, typically, um, of the issues they knew. They know the supply chain situation. So um, actually, it really gave you a chance to collaborate and work with them and, and work out the details because um, we, we're all in this together. <laughs> so, right. Yes. Uh, it's right, but it's true, right? And so um, it, it, we we're looking at a global pandemic. So it wasn't um, that, you know, one supplier was out of something. So I found that we we typically overall had a, uh, you know, customers were very understanding. I mean, we are still dealing with um, uh, container shortages for export shipments that that seems to be what's uh, been the lengthiest for us is um, our export department working with with drivers which that is a much more difficult uh, field to secure containers for something going outside of the country or going into Canada so that's that's taken more time we've looked at we've had really lengthy um, you know, delays with those Many shipments. times, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. But oh my goodness. overall, I mean, it, it's, we worked it out and we just, again, continuously communicated when we, as much as we could with the customers. That's fantastic. It's amazing how this, this pandemic sort of re-emphasized business relationships and collaboration yeah. and, and all the things that seem to be going out of fashion for a while. But, um, Absolutely. All right, yeah. we're, we're, we're getting a little tight on time. So I have one last question and, and this is actually for Bill. Uh, if you had to leave companies with one piece of advice around their logistics operations and initiatives, what would that be? Um, it's interesting because um, I mean, it's, it, it's it, it, the answer I have is now kind of informed from from uh, listening to you guys. And thank you, first and foremost, Kim and, and, and Nancy for uh, participating today, because it was, as always, I mentioned it, Nancy already when, I, when you spoke and did your overview, I always learned something. Uh, Kim definitely learned something from you, too, because I always think of you guys as being piped, didn't know you guys were into plastics and, and all that. So um, for me, um, one of the things, if, if you know, one piece of advice when you're looking at logistics and the operations, especially if you're talking about doing uh, kind of projects, um, whether it be a system or a process improvement, um, is, and I know it sounds like a, you know an SAP type answer, but I, I, way back I used to actually implement TMSs, and I, so I had to look at it from a, a process perspective. Also, is look at it holistically, um, and I know that sounds like a, a kind of a trite word or an, you know or an SAT word if you think about it from high mm -hmm. school but you know look at it completely or comprehensively um, because you don't want to just look at you know and I going back to where I focus transportation um, I don't want to optimize my transportation process without thinking about what the impact is on warehousing you know it's like, great I have a, a really efficient transportation plan but if there's nobody there to receive the trucks or to, uh, you know, load the trucks, what good is that? Uh, inversely, if I come up with this great transportation plan, but it's not hitting, you know, my service levels, then customer service is going to be on the phone nonstop trying to, you know, 
you know, plug the holes in, 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 those, in, in that side of the thing. Um, so really looking at it and, and involve folks from those different parts of the organization. Um, I mean, I thought it was interesting, you know, Nancy, you were talking about how, you know, you had the shift to, you know, work from home. And, you know, what was the impact there? So, you know, involving them and getting to understand, okay, what's the impact, like from a manufacturing perspective, as well as from a transportation perspective. Um, so really looking at it holistically, you know, and that's why, you know, we try and talk about logistics, not just transportation. Um, so look at, it, look at it that way. So that's what I would suggest. Um, that's great, Bill. Yeah, so a, a holistic approach. I think that's a super word. It's one of my favorites. Anyway, and very wise, wise words. So I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much to Bill and especially to Nancy and Kim for participating. We really, it's always so great when we have real users coming in and talking about practical everyday use. Um, and thanks to everyone who, who tuned in to participate. I think we learned a lot about the importance of transportation management technology and a holistic approach to resilient supply chains. Um, we had a lot of questions today and we'll be answering the ones we didn't get to with you offline. If your question during uh, Q&A wasn't answered or if you have follow-up questions, please do feel free to contact Bill at SAP at the email you see on your screen now. Stay safe. Stay happy and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.